people of the dark. I came to Dagon's cave to kill Richard Brent. I went down the dusty avenues made by the towering trees, and my mood well matched the primitive grimness of the scene. The approach to Dagon's cave is always dark, for the mighty branches and thick leaves shut out the sun, and now the somberness of my own soul made the shadows seem more ominous and gloomy than was natural. Not far away I heard the slow wash of the waves against the tall cliffs, but the sea itself was out of sight, masked by the dense oak forest. The darkness and the stark gloom of my surroundings gripped my shadowed soul as I passed beneath the ancient branches, as I came out into a narrow glade and saw the mouth of the ancient cavern before me. I paused, scanning the cavern's exterior and the dim reaches of the silent oaks. The man I hated had not come before me. I was in time to carry out my grim intent. For a moment my resolution faltered, then, like a wave, there surged over me the fragrance of Eleanor Bland, a vision of wavy golden hair and deep gray eyes, changing and mystic as the sea. I clenched my hands until the knuckles showed white and instinctively touched the wicked snub-nosed revolver whose weight sagged my coat pocket. But for Richard Brent I felt certain I had already won this woman, desire for whom made my waking hours a torment and my sleep a torture. Whom did she love? She would not say. I did not believe she knew. Let one of us go away, I thought, and she would turn to the other, and I was going to simplify matters for her and for myself. By chance I had overheard my blond English rival remark that he intended coming to lonely Dagon's cave on an idle exploring outing alone. I am not by nature criminal. I was born and raised in a hard country, and have lived most of my life on the raw edges of the world, where a man took what he wanted, if he could, and mercy was a virtue little known. But it was a torment that racked me day and night that sent me out to take the life of Richard Brent. I have lived hard, and violently, perhaps. When love overtook me, it also was fierce and violent. Perhaps I was not wholly sane, what with my love for Eleanor Bland and my hatred for Richard Brent. Under any other circumstances I would have been glad to call him my friend, a fine, rangy, upstanding young fellow, clear-eyed and strong. But he stood in the way of my desire, and he must die. I stepped into the dimness of the cave and halted. I had never before visited Dagon's cave, yet a vague sense of misplaced familiarity troubled me as I gazed on the high, arching roof, the even stone walls, and the dusty floor. I shrugged my shoulders, unable to place the elusive feeling. Doubtless it was evoked by a similarity to caverns in the mountain country of the American Southwest, where I was born and spent my childhood. And yet, I knew that I had never seen a cave like this one, whose regular aspect gave rise to myths that it was not a natural cavern, but had been hewn from the solid rock ages ago by the tiny hands of the mysterious little people, the prehistoric beings of British legend. The whole countryside thereabouts was a haunt for ancient folklore. The country folk were predominantly Celtic. Here the Saxon invaders had never prevailed, and the legends reached back, in that long-settled countryside, further than anywhere else in England, back beyond the coming of the Saxons, aye, and incredibly beyond that distant age, beyond the coming of the Romans, to those unbelievably ancient days when the native Britons warred with black-haired Irish pirates. The little people, of course, had their part in the lore. Legend said that this cavern was one of their last strongholds against the conquering Celts, and hinted at lost tunnels, long fallen in or blocked up, connecting the cave with a network of subterranean corridors which honeycombed the hills. With these chance meditations vying idly in my mind with grimmer speculations, I passed through the outer chamber of the cavern and entered a narrow tunnel, which I knew by former descriptions 
connected with a larger room. It was dark in the tunnel, but not too dark for me to make out the vague, half-defaced outlines of mysterious etchings on the stone walls. I ventured to switch on my electric torch and examine them more closely. Even in their dimness I was repelled by their abnormal and revolting character. Surely no men cast in human mold as we know it scratched those grotesque obscenities. The Little People I wondered if those anthropologists were correct in their theory of a squat mongoloid aboriginal race, so low in the scale of evolution as to be scarcely human, yet possessing a distinct, though repulsive, culture of their own. They had vanished before the invading races, theory said, forming the base of all Aryan legends of trolls, elves, dwarves, and witches. Living in caves from the start, these aborigines had retreated farther and farther into the caverns of the hills before the conquerors, vanishing at last entirely, though folklore fancy pictures their descendants still dwelling in the lost chasms far beneath the hills, loathsome survivals of an outworn age. I snapped off the torch and passed through the tunnel to come out into a sort of doorway which seemed entirely too symmetrical to have been the work of nature. I was looking into a vast, dim cavern, at a somewhat lower level than the outer chamber, and again I shuddered with a strange, alien sense of familiarity. A short flight of steps led down from the tunnel to the floor of the cavern, tiny steps, too small for normal human feet, carved into the solid stone. Their edges were greatly worn away, as if by ages of use. I started the descent. My foot slipped suddenly. I instinctively knew what was coming. It was all in part with that strange feeling of familiarity, but I could not catch myself. I fell headlong down the steps and struck the stone floor with a crash that blotted out my senses. Slowly consciousness returned to me with a throbbing of my head and a sensation of bewilderment. I lifted a hand to my head and found it caked with blood. I had received a blow, or I had taken a fall, but so completely had my wits been knocked out of me that my mind was an absolute blank. Where I was, who I was, I did not know. I looked about, blinking in the dim light, and saw that I was in a wide, dusty cavern. I stood at the foot of a short flight of steps which led upward into some kind of tunnel. I ran my hand dazedly through my square-cut black mane and my eyes wandered over my massive naked limbs and powerful torso. I was clad, I noticed absently, in a sort of loincloth, from the girdle of which swung an empty scabbard, and leathern sandals were on my feet. Then I saw an object lying at my feet, and stooped and took it up. It was a heavy iron sword, whose broad blade was darkly stained. My fingers fitted instinctively about its hilt, with the familiarity of long usage. Then suddenly I remembered, and laughed, to think that a fall on his head should render me, Conan of the Reavers, so completely daft. Aye, it all came back to me now. It had been a raid on the Britons, on whose coasts we continually swooped with torch and sword, from the island called Arian. That day we of the black-haired gale had swept suddenly down on a coastal village in our long, low ships, and in the hurricane of battle which followed, the Britons had at last given up the stubborn contest and retreated, warriors, women, and bairns, into the deep shadows of the oak forests, whither we seldom dared follow. But I had followed, for there was a girl of my foes whom I desired with a burning passion a lithe, slim young creature with wavy golden hair and deep gray eyes, changing and mystic as the sea. Her name was Tamara. Well I knew it, for there was trade between the races as well as war, and I had been in the villages of the Britons as a peaceful visitor in times of rare truce. I saw her white half-clad body flickering among the trees as she ran with the swiftness of a doe, and I followed, panting with fierce eagerness. Under the dark shadows of the gnarled oaks she fled, with me in close pursuit, 
while far away behind us died out the shouts of slaughter and the clashing of swords. Then we ran in silence, save for her quick labored panting, and I was so close behind her as we emerged into a narrow glade before a somber-mouthed cavern that I caught her flying golden tresses with one mighty hand. She sank down with a despairing wail, and even so a shout echoed her cry, and I wheeled quickly to face a rangy young Briton who sprang from among the trees, the light of desperation in his eyes. Verterix, the girl wailed, her voice breaking in a sob, and fiercer rage welled up in me, for I knew the lad was her lover. Run for the forest, Tamara, he shouted, and leaped at me as a panther leaps, his bronze axe whirling like a flashing wheel about his head, and then sounded the clangor of strife and the hard-drawn panting of combat. The Briton was as tall as I, but he was lithe where I was massive. The advantage of sheer muscular power was mine, and soon he was on the defensive, striving desperately to parry my heavy strokes with his axe. Hammering on his guard like a smith on an anvil, I pressed him relentlessly, driving him irresistibly before me. His chest heaved, his breath came in labored gasps, his blood dripped from the scalp, chest, and thigh where my whistling blade had cut the skin and all but gone home. As I redoubled my strokes and he bent and swayed beneath them like a sapling in a storm, I heard the girl cry, Verterix, Verterix, the cave, into the cave! I saw his face pale with a fear greater than that induced by my hacking sword. Not there, he gasped. Better a clean death. In Ilmarinen's name, girl, run into the forest and save yourself. I will not leave you, she cried. The cave! It is our one chance! I saw her flash past us like a flying wisp of white and vanish in the cavern, and with a despairing cry the youth launched a wild, desperate stroke that nigh cleft my skull. As I staggered beneath the blow I had barely parried, he sprang away, leaped into the cavern after the girl and vanished in the gloom. With a maddened yell that invoked all my grim Gaelic gods, I sprang recklessly after them, not reckoning if the Briton lurked beside the entrance to brain me as I rushed in, but a quick glance showed the chamber empty, and a wisp of white disappearing through a dark doorway in the back wall. I raced across the cavern and came to a sudden halt as an axe licked out of the gloom of the entrance and whistled perilously close to my black-maned head. I gave back suddenly. Now the advantage was with Verterix, who stood in the narrow mouth of the corridor where I could hardly come at him without exposing myself to the devastating stroke of his axe. I was near frothing with fury, and the sight of a slim white form among the deep shadows behind the warrior drove me into a frenzy. I attacked savagely but warily, thrusting venomously at my foe and drawing back from his strokes. I wished to draw him out into a wide lunge, avoid it, and run him through before he could recover his balance. In the open I could have beat him down by sheer power and heavy blows, but here I could only use the point, and that at a disadvantage. I always preferred the edge. But I was stubborn, if I could not come at him with a finishing stroke, neither could he or the girl escape me while I kept him hemmed in the tunnel. It must have been the realization of this fact that prompted the girl's action, for she said something to Verterix about looking for a way leading out, and though he cried out fiercely, forbidding her to venture away into the darkness, she turned and ran swiftly down the tunnel to vanish in the dimness. My wrath rose appallingly and I nearly got my head split in my eagerness to bring down my foe before she found a means for their escape. Then the cavern echoed with a terrible scream, and Verterix cried out like a man death-stricken, his face ashy in the gloom. He whirled as if he had forgotten me and my sword, and raced down the tunnel like a madman, shrieking Tamara's name. From far away, as if from the bowels of the earth, I seemed to hear her answering cry, mingled with a strange, sibilant clamor that electrified me with nameless but instinctive horror. Then silence fell, broken only by Verterix's frenzied cries, receding farther and farther into the earth.
Recovering myself, I sprang into the tunnel and raced after the Briton as recklessly as he had run after the girl, and to give me my due, red-handed reaver though I was, cutting down my rival from behind was less in my mind than discovering what dread thing had Tamara in its clutches. As I ran along, I noted absently that the sides of the tunnel were scrawled with monstrous pictures, and realized suddenly and creepily that this must be the dread cavern of the children of the night, tales of which had crossed the narrow sea to resound horrifically in the ears of the gales. Terror of me must have ridden Tamara hard to have driven her into the cavern shunned by her people, where, it was said, lurked the survivals of that grisly race which inhabited the land before the coming of the Picts and Britons, and which had fled before them into the unknown caverns of the hills. Ahead of me the tunnel opened into a wide chamber, and I saw the form of Verterix glimmer momentarily in the semi-darkness and vanish in what appeared to be the entrance of a corridor opposite the mouth of the tunnel I had just traversed. Instantly there sounded a short, fierce shout, and the crash of a hard-driven blow mixed with the hysterical screams of a girl and a medley of serpent-like hissing that made my hair bristle. And at that instant I shot out of the tunnel, running at full speed, and realized too late the floor of the cavern lay several feet below the level of the tunnel. My flying feet missed the tiny steps, and I crashed terrifically on the solid stone floor. Now, as I stood in the semi-darkness, rubbing my aching head, all this came back to me, and I stared fearsomely across the vast chamber at that black, cryptic corridor into which Tamara and her lover had disappeared, and over which silence lay like a pall. Gripping my sword, I warily crossed the great still cavern and peered into the corridor. Only a denser darkness met my eyes. I entered, striving to pierce the gloom, and as my foot slipped on a wide, wet smear on the stone floor, the raw, acrid scent of fresh-spilled blood met my nostrils. Someone or something had died there, either the young Briton or his unknown attacker. I stood there uncertainly, all the supernatural fears that are the heritage of the gale rising in my primitive soul. I could turn and stride out of these accursed mazes, into the clear sunlight and down to the clean blue sea where my comrades, no doubt, impatiently awaited me after the routing of the Britons. Why should I risk my life among these grisly rat-dens? I was eaten with curiosity to know what manner of beings haunted the cavern, and who were called the children of the night by the Britons, but it was my love for the yellow-haired girl which drove me down that dark tunnel, and love her I did in my way, and would have been kind to her had I carried her away to my island haunt. I walked softly along the corridor blade ready. What sort of creatures the children of the night were I had no idea, but the tales of the Britons had lent them a distinctly inhuman nature. The darkness closed around me as I advanced until I was moving in utter blackness. My groping left hand encountered a strangely carven doorway, and at that instant something hissed like a viper beside me and slashed fiercely at my thigh. I struck back savagely and felt my blind stroke crunch home, and something fell at my feet and died. What thing I had slain in the dark I could not know, but it must have been at least partly human, because the shallow gash in my thigh had been made with a blade of some sort, and not by fangs or talons. And I sweated with horror, for the gods know, the hissing voice of the thing had resembled no human tongue I had ever heard. And now in the darkness ahead of me I heard the sound repeated, mingled with horrible slitherings, as if numbers of reptilian creatures were approaching. I stepped quickly into the entrance my groping hand had discovered, and came near repeating my headlong fall, for instead of letting into another level corridor, the entrance gave onto a flight of dwarfish steps, on which I floundered wildly. Recovering my balance, I went on cautiously, groping along the sides of the shaft for support. I seemed to be descending into the very bowels of the earth, but I dared not turn back. Suddenly, far below me, I glimpsed a faint, eerie light. 
I went on perforce, and came to a spot where the shaft opened into another great vaulted chamber, and I shrank back, aghast. In the center of the chamber stood a grim, black altar. It had been rubbed all over with a sort of phosphorus, so that it glowed dully, lending a semi-illumination to the shadowy cavern. Towering behind it, on a pedestal of human skulls, lay a cryptic black object, carven with mysterious hieroglyphics. The Black Stone. The ancient, ancient stone, before which, the Briton said, the children of the night bowed in gruesome worship, and whose origin was lost in the black mists of a hideously distant past. Once, legend said, it had stood in that grim circle of monoliths called Stonehenge, before its votaries had been driven like chaff before the bows of the Picts. But I gave it but a passing, shuddering glance. Two figures lay, bound with rawhide thongs, on the glowing black altar. One was Tamara. The other was Verterix, blood-stained and disheveled. His bronze axe, crusted with clotted blood, lay near the altar, and before the glowing stone squatted horror. Though I had never seen one of those ghoulish aborigines, I knew this thing for what it was, and shuddered. It was a man of a sort, but so low in the stage of life that its distorted humanness was more horrible than its bestiality. Erect, it could not have been five feet in height. Its body was scrawny and deformed, its head disproportionately large. Lank, snaky hair fell over a square, inhuman face with flabby, writhing lips that bared yellow fangs, flat, spreading nostrils, and great yellow slant eyes. I knew the creature must be able to see in the dark as well as a cat. Centuries of skulking in dim caverns had lent the race terrible and inhuman attributes. But the most repellent feature was its skin, scaly, yellow, and mottled, like the hide of a serpent. A loincloud made of a real snake's skin girt its lean loins, and its taloned hands gripped a short, stone-tipped spear and a sinister-looking mallet of polished flint. So intently was it gloating over its captives, it evidently had not heard my stealthy descent. As I hesitated in the shadows of the shaft, far above me I heard a soft, sinister rustling that chilled the blood in my veins. The children were creeping down the shaft behind me, and I was trapped. I saw other entrances opening on the chamber, and I acted, realizing that an alliance with Verterix was our only hope. Enemies though we were, we were men, cast in the same mold, trapped in the lair of these indescribable monstrosities. As I stepped from the shaft, the horror beside the altar jerked up his head and glared full at me, and as he sprang up I leaped and he crumpled, blood spurting, as my heavy sword split his reptilian heart. But even as he died he gave tongue in an abhorrent shriek which was echoed far up the shaft. In desperate haste, I cut Verterix's bonds and dragged him to his feet. And I turned to Tamara, who in that dire extremity did not shrink from me, but looked up at me with pleading, terror-dilated eyes. Verterix wasted no time in words, realizing chance had made allies of us. He snatched up his axe as I freed the girl. "'We can't go up the shaft,' he explained swiftly. "'We'll have the whole pack upon us quickly.' They caught Tamara as she sought for an exit, and overpowered me by sheer numbers when I followed. They dragged us hither, and all but that carrion scattered, bearing word of the sacrifice through all their burrows, I doubt not. Ilmarinen alone knows how many of my people, stolen in the night, have died on that altar. We must take our chance in one of these tunnels. All lead to hell. Follow me. Seizing Tamara's hand, he ran fleetly into the nearest tunnel, and I followed. A glance back into the chamber before a turn in the corridor blotted it from view showed a revolting horde streaming out of the shaft. The tunnel slanted steeply upward, and suddenly ahead of us we saw a bar of gray light. But the next instant our cries of hope changed to curses of bitter disappointment. There was daylight, I, drifting in through a cleft in the vaulted roof, 
but far, far above our reach. Behind us the pack gave tongue exultingly, and I halted. Save yourselves if you can, I growled. Here I make my stand. They can see in the dark, and I cannot. Here at least I can see them. Go. But Verterix halted also. Little use to be hunted like rats to our doom. There is no escape. Let us meet our fate like men. Tamara cried out, wringing her hands, but she clung to her lover. Stand behind me with the girl, I grunted. When I fall, dash out her brains with your axe, lest they take her alive again. Then sell your own life as high as you may, for there is none to avenge us. His keen eyes met mine squarely. We worship different gods, Riva, he said, but all gods love brave men. Mayhap we shall meet again, beyond the dark. Hail and farewell, Britain, I growled and our right hands gripped like steel. Hail and farewell, Gale. And I wheeled as a hideous horde swept up the tunnel and burst into the dim light, a flying nightmare of streaming snaky hair, foam-flecked lips and glaring eyes. Thundering my war cry, I sprang to meet them, and my heavy sword sang, and a head spun grinning from its shoulder on an arching fountain of blood. They came upon me like a wave, and the fighting madness of my race was upon me. I fought as a maddened beast fights, and at every stroke I clove through flesh and bone, and blood spattered in a crimson rain. Then as they surged in, and I went down beneath the sheer weight of their numbers, a fierce yell cut the din, and Verterix's axe sang above me, splattering blood and brains like water. The press slackened, and I staggered up trampling the writhing bodies beneath my feet. "'A stair behind us!' the Briton was screaming. "'Half hidden in an angle of the wall! It must lead to daylight! Up it, in the name of Ilmarinen!' So we fell back, fighting our way inch by inch. The vermin fought like blood-hungry devils, clambering over the bodies of the slain to screech and hack. Both of us were streaming blood at every step when we reached the mouth of the shaft, into which Tamara had preceded us. Screaming like very fiends, the children surged in to drag us down. The shaft was not as light as had been the corridor, and it grew darker as we climbed, but our foes could only come at us from in front. By the gods we slaughtered them till the stair was littered with mangled corpses, and the children frothed like mad wolves. Then suddenly they abandoned the fray, and raced back down the steps. "'What portends this?' gasped Verderix shaking the bloody sweat from his eyes. "'Up that shaft! Quick!' I panted. "'They mean to mount some other stair and come at us from above!' So we raced up those accursed steps, slipping and stumbling, and as we fled past a black tunnel that opened into the shaft, far down it we heard a frightful howling. An instant later we emerged from the shaft into a winding corridor, dimly illumined by a vague gray light filtering in from above, and somewhere in the bowels of the earth I seemed to hear the thunder of rushing water. We started down the corridor, and as we did so, a heavy weight smashed on my shoulders, knocking me headlong, and a mallet crashed again and again on my head, sending dull red flashes of agony across my brain. With a volcanic wrench I dragged my attacker off and under me, and tore out his throat with my naked fingers, and his fangs met in my arm in his death bite. Reeling up, I saw that Tamara and Verterix had passed out of sight. I had been somewhat behind them, and they had run on, knowing nothing of the fiend which had leaped on my shoulders. Doubtless they thought I was still close on their heels. A dozen steps I took, then halted. The corridor branched, and I knew not which way my companions had taken. At blind venture I turned into the left-hand branch, and staggered on in the semi-darkness, I was weak from fatigue and loss of blood, dizzy and sick from the blows I had received. Only the thought of Tamara kept me doggedly on my feet. Now distinctly I heard the sound of an unseen torrent. That I was not far underground was evident by the dim light which filtered in from somewhere above, and I momentarily expected to come upon another stair. But when I did, I halted in black despair. Instead of up, 
it led down. Somewhere far behind me I heard faintly the howls of the pack, and I went down, plunging into utter darkness. At last I struck a level and went along blindly. I had given up all hope of escape, and only hoped to find Tamara, if she and her lover had not found a way of escape, and die with her. The thunder of rushing water was above my head now, and the tunnel was slimy and dank. Drops of moisture fell on my head, and I knew I was passing under the river. Then I blundered again upon steps cut in the stone, and these led upward. I scrambled up as fast as my stiffening wounds would allow, and I had taken punishment enough to have killed an ordinary man. Up I went, and up, and suddenly daylight burst on me through a cleft in the solid rock. I stepped into the blaze of the sun. I was standing on a ledge high above the rushing waters of a river which raced at awesome speed between towering cliffs. The ledge on which I stood was close to the top of the cliff. Safety was within arm's length, but I hesitated, and such was my love for the golden-haired girl that I was ready to retrace my steps through those black tunnels on the mad hope of finding her. Then I started. Across the river I saw another cleft in the cliff wall which fronted me, with a ledge similar to that on which I stood, but longer. In olden times, I doubt not, some sort of primitive bridge connected the two ledges, possibly before the tunnel was dug beneath the riverbed. Now, as I watched, two figures emerged upon that other ledge, one gashed, dust-stained, limping, gripping a blood-stained axe, the other slim, white, and girlish. Verterix and Tamara. They had taken the other branch of the corridor at the fork, and had evidently followed the windows of the tunnel to emerge as I had done, except that I had taken the left turn and passed clear under the river. And now I saw that they were in a trap. On that side the cliffs rose half a hundred feet higher than on my side of the river, and so sheer a spider could scarce have scaled them. There were only two ways of escape from the ledge back through the fiend-haunted tunnels, or straight down to the river which raved far beneath. I saw Verterix look up the sheer cliffs and then down, and shake his head in despair. Tamara put her arms about his neck, and though I could not hear their voices for the rush of the river, I saw them smile, and then they went together to the edge of the ledge. And out of the cleft swarmed a loathsome mob, as foul reptiles writhe up out of the darkness, and they stood blinking in the sunlight like the night things they were. I gripped my sword-hilt in the agony of my helplessness until the blood trickled from under my fingernails. Why had not the pack followed me instead of my companions? The children hesitated an instant as the two Britons faced them. Then with a laugh Verterix hurled his axe far out into the rushing river, and turning caught Tamara in a last embrace. Together they sprang far out, and still locked in each other's arms, hurtled downward, struck the madly foaming water that seemed to leap up to meet them, and vanished. And the wild river swept on, like a blind, insensate monster, thundering along the echoing cliffs. A moment I stood frozen. Then, like a man in a dream, I turned, caught the edge of the cliff above me, and wearily drew myself up and over, and stood on my feet above the cliffs, hearing like a dim dream the roar of the river far beneath. I reeled up, dazedly clutching my throbbing head, on which dried blood was clotted. I glared wildly about me. I had clambered the cliffs. No, by the thunder of Crom, I was still in the cavern, I reached for my sword. The mists faded, and I stared about dizzily, orienting myself with space and time. I stood at the foot of the steps down which I had fallen. I, who had been Conan the Reaver, was John O'Brien. Was all that grotesque interlude a dream? Could a mere dream appear so vivid? Even in dreams we often know we are dreaming but Conan the Reaver had no cognizance of any other existence. More, he remembered his own past life as a living man remembers, 
though in the waking mind of John O'Brien that memory faded into dust and mist. But the adventures of Conan in the Cavern of the Children stood clear-etched in the mind of John O'Brien. I glanced across the dim chamber toward the entrance of the tunnel into which Verterix had followed the girl. But I looked in vain, seeing only the bare blank wall of the cavern. I crossed the chamber, switched on my electric torch, miraculously unbroken in my fall, and felt along the wall. Ha! I started as from an electric shock. Exactly where the entrance should have been, my fingers detected a difference in material, a section which was rougher than the rest of the wall. I was convinced that it was of comparatively modern workmanship. The tunnel had been walled up. I thrust against it, exerting all my strength, and it seemed to me that the section was about to give. I drew back, and taking a deep breath, launched my full weight against it, backed by all the power of my giant muscles. The brittle, decaying wall gave way with a shattering crash, and I catapulted through in a shower of stones and falling masonry. I scrambled up, a sharp cry escaping me. I stood in a tunnel, and I could not mistake the feeling of similarity this time. Here Verterix had first fallen foul of the children, as they dragged Tamara away, and here where I now stood the floor had been awash with blood. I walked down the corridor like a man in a trance. Soon I should come to the doorway on the left. I, there it was, the strangely carven portal, at the mouth of which I had slain the unseen being which reared up in the dark beside me. I shivered momentarily. Could it be possible that remnants of that foul race still lurked hideously in these remote caverns? I turned into the doorway and my light shone down a long, slanting shaft, with tiny steps cut into the solid stone. Down these had Conan the Reaver gone groping, and down them went I, John O'Brien, with memories of that other life filling my brain with vague phantasms. No light glimmered ahead of me, but I came into the great dim chamber I had known of yore, and I shuddered as I saw the grim black altar etched in the gleam of my torch. Now no bound figures writhed there, no crouching horror gloated before it, nor did the pyramid of skulls support the black stone before which unknown races had bowed before Egypt was born out of time's dawn. Only a littered heap of dust lay strewn where the skulls had upheld the hellish thing. No, that had been no dream. I was John O'Brien, but I had been Conan of the Reavers in that other life, and that grim interlude a brief episode of reality which I had relived. I entered the tunnel down which we had fled, shining a beam of light ahead, and saw the bar of grey light drifting down from above, just as in that other lost age. Here the Briton and I, Conan, had turned at bay, I turned my eyes from the ancient cleft high up in the vaulted roof and looked for the stair. There it was, half concealed by an angle in the wall. I mounted, remembering how hardly Verterix and I had gone up so many ages before, with the horde hissing and frothing at our heels. I found myself tense with dread as I approached the dark, gaping entrance through which the pack had sought to cut us off. I had snapped off the light when I came into the dim-lit corridor below, and now I glanced into the well of blackness which opened on the stair, and with a cry I started back, nearly losing my footing on the worn steps. Sweating in the semi-darkness, I switched on the light and directed its beam into the cryptic opening, revolver in hand. I saw only the bare, rounded sides of a small, shaft-like tunnel, and I laughed nervously. My imagination was running riot. I could have sworn that hideous yellow eyes glared terribly at me from the darkness, and that a crawling something had scuttered away down the tunnel. I was foolish to let these imaginings upset me. The children had long ago vanished from these caverns, a nameless and abhorrent race closer to the serpent than the man. They had centuries ago faded back into the oblivion from which they had crawled 
in the black dawn ages of the earth. I came out of the shaft into the winding corridor, which, as I remembered of old, was lighter. Here from the shadows a lurking thing had leaped on my back while my companions ran on, unknowing. What a brute of a man Conan had been, to keep going after receiving such savage wounds. Aye, in that age all men were iron. I came to the place where the tunnel forked, and as before I took the left-hand branch and came to the shaft that led down. Down this I went, listening for the roar of the river but not hearing it. Again the darkness shut in about the shaft, so I was forced to have recourse to my electric torch again, lest I lose my footing and plunge to my death. Oh, I, John O'Brien, am not nearly so sure-footed as was I, Conan the Reaver. No, nor as tigerishly powerful and quick, either. I soon struck the dank lower level, and felt again the dampness that denoted my position under the riverbed, but still I could not hear the rush of the water. And indeed I knew that whatever mighty river had rushed roaring to the sea in those ancient times, there was no such body of water among the hills to-day. I halted, flashing my light about. I was in a vast tunnel, not very high of roof, but broad. Other smaller tunnels branched off from it, and I wondered at the network which apparently honeycombed the hills. I cannot describe the grim, gloomy effect of those dark, low-roofed corridors far below the earth. Over all hung an overpowering sense of unspeakable antiquity. Why had the little people carved out these mysterious crypts, and in which black age? Were these caverns their last refuge from the onrushing tides of humanity, or their castles since time immemorial? I shook my head in bewilderment. The bestiality of the children I had seen, yet somehow they had been able to carve these tunnels and chambers that might balk modern engineers. Even supposing that they had but completed a task begun by nature, still it was a stupendous work for a race of dwarfish aborigines. Then I realized with a start that I was spending more time in these gloomy tunnels than I cared for and began to hunt for the steps by which Conan had ascended. I found them, and, following them up, breathed again deeply in relief as the sudden glow of daylight filled the shaft. I came out upon the ledge, now worn away until it was little more than a bump on the face of the cliff, and I saw the great river, which had roared like a prisoned monster between the sheer walls of its narrow canyon, had dwindled away with the passing eons until it was no more than a tiny stream far beneath me, trickling soundlessly among the stones on its way to the sea. Aye, the surface of the earth changes, the rivers swell or shrink, the mountains heave and topple, the lakes dry up, the continents alter. But under the earth, the work of lost, mysterious hands slumbers untouched by the sweep of time. Their work, aye, but what of the hands that reared that work? Did they, too, lurk beneath the bosoms of the hills? How long I stood there, lost in dim speculations, I do not know. But suddenly, glancing across at the other ledge, crumbling and weathered, I shrank back into the entrance behind me. Two figures came out upon the ledge, and I gasped to see that they were Richard Brent and Eleanor Bland. Now I remembered why I had come to the cavern, and my hand instinctively sought the revolver in my pocket. They did not see me, but I could see them, and hear them plainly, too, since no roaring river now thundered between the ledges. "'By gad, Eleanor,' Brent was saying, "'I'm glad you decided to come with me. Who would have guessed there was anything to those old tales about hidden tunnels leading from the cavern?' I wonder how that section of wall came to collapse. I thought I heard a crash just as we entered the outer cave. Do you suppose some beggar was in the cavern ahead of us and broke it in? I don't know, she answered. I remember—oh, I don't know. It almost seems as if I'd been here before, or dreamed I had. I seem to faintly remember, like a far-off nightmare, running, running, running endlessly— through these dark corridors, 
with hideous creatures on my heels. Was I there? jokingly asked Brent. Yes. And John, too, she answered. But you were not Richard Brent, and John was not John O'Brien. No, and I was not Eleanor Bland, either. Oh, it's so dim and far off, I can't describe it at all. It's hazy and misty and terrible. I understand a little, he said unexpectedly. Ever since we came to the place where the wall had fallen and revealed the old tunnel, I've had a sense of familiarity with the place. There was horror and danger and battle and love, too. He stepped nearer the edge to look down in the gorge, and Eleanor cried out sharply and suddenly, seizing him in a convulsive grasp. "'Don't, Richard, don't! Hold me! Oh, hold me tight!' He caught her in his arms. "'Why, Eleanor, dear, what's the matter?' "'Nothing,' she faltered, but she clung closer to him, and I saw she was trembling. "'Just a strange feeling, rushing dizziness and fright, just as if I were falling from a great height. "'Don't go near the edge, Dick. It scares me. I won't, dear,' he answered, drawing her closer to him and continuing hesitantly. "'Eleanor, there's something I've wanted to ask you for a long time. Well, I haven't the knack of putting things in an elegant way. I love you, Eleanor. Always have. You know that. But if you don't love me, I'll take myself off and won't annoy you any more. Only please tell me one way or another, for I can't stand it any longer. Is it I or the American? You, Dick, she answered, hiding her face on his shoulder. It's always been you, though I didn't know it. I think a great deal of John O'Brien. I didn't know which of you I really loved. But today, as we came through those terrible tunnels and climbed those fearful stairs, and just now, when I thought for some strange reason we were falling from the ledge, I realized it was you I loved, that I always loved you, through more lives than this one. Always. Their lips met, and I saw her golden head cradled on his shoulder. My lips were dry, my heart cold, yet my soul was at peace. They belonged to each other. Eons ago they lived and loved, and because of that love they suffered and died, and I, Conan, had driven them to that doom. I saw them turn toward the cleft their arms about each other. Then I heard Tamara, I mean Eleanor, shriek. I saw them both recoil, and out of the cleft a horror came writhing, a loathsome, brain-shattering thing that blinked in the clean sunlight. I, I knew it of old, vestige of a forgotten age. It came writhing its horrid shape up out of the darkness of the earth, and the lost past to claim its own. What three thousand years of retrogression can do to a race hideous in the beginning, I saw and shuddered, and instinctively I knew that in all the world it was the only one of its kind, a monster that had lived on. God alone knows how many centuries, wallowing in the slime of its dank subterranean lairs. Before the children had vanished, the race must have lost all human semblance living as they did the life of the reptile. This thing was more like a giant serpent than anything else, but it had aborted legs and snaky arms with hooked talons. It crawled on its belly, writhing back mottled lips to bear needle-like fangs, which I felt must drip with venom. It hissed as it reared up its ghastly head on a horribly long neck, while its yellow slanted eyes glittered with all the horror that is spawned in the black lairs under the earth. I knew those eyes had blazed at me from the dark tunnel opening on the stair. For some reason the creature had fled from me, possibly because it feared my light, and it stood to reason that it was the only one remaining in the caverns else I had been set upon in the darkness. But for it the tunnels could be traversed in safety. Now the reptilian thing writhed toward the humans trapped on the ledge. 
Brent had thrust Eleanor behind him and stood, face ashy, to guard her as best he could. And I gave thanks silently that I, John O'Brien, could pay the debt I, Conan the Reaver, owed these lovers since long ago. The monster reared up, and Brent, with cold courage, sprang to meet it with his naked hands. Taking quick aim, I fired once. The shot echoed like the crack of doom between the towering cliffs, and the horror, with a hideously human scream, staggered wildly, swayed, and pitched headlong, knotting and writhing like a wounded python, to tumble from the sloping ledge and fall plummet-like to the rocks far below.